Jihagovich, uh, welcome and thank you very much uh, for joining us. I'm Jay Hodges, a proud friend of Sinn Féin's. Uh, we're going to have a very special conversation today. Uh, before we get started in that, I just want to tell you that this is going to be one conversation you're going to want to share with friends and family because uh, we get to hear from a guy named Danny Morrison. And if you don't know Danny, he's an author, he's a lifelong activist. He played a critical role in the public events uh, during the troubles in Northern Ireland. Uh, he's formerly Sinn Féin's publicity director. He was an editor of the Republican News. Um, he's uh, editor of Unfudlock. Um, he's the secretary of Bobby Sands Trust. Danny has a lifelong history of Republican activism. So without further ado, uh, I wanna welcome uh, Mr. Danny Morrison. Danny, how are you today? I'm fine. Hey, thank you very much for having me on the show. Uh, well, I appreciate your time. Uh, I got a million questions and, and we're not going to have time to get to them all. Um, but I just want to kind of jump right in. Uh, can you talk about just kind of your upbringing, your childhood, like how you got first involved uh, and, and what it was kind of like around you? Just kind of set the stage for how one becomes Danny Morrison. Well, I'm doing this interview from my home in Anderson Town. West Belfast, which is where I was actually born in 1953. Um, the Morrison said in my family basically go back to Scottish Presbyterians. Uh, there's been a very pro-British set to the family. My father, for example, joined the RAF in 1944. My grandfather fought in the First and Second World War. On my mother's side, there was, uh, they were very traditional Irish. Uh, many of my relatives would be Gaelic speakers. I had an uncle who became Chief of Staff of the IRA in the 1940s, Harry White. And he was actually sentenced to death uh, at one stage, though because of an international clemency campaign uh, that was reduced and he, he served time in prison, uh, both north and in the south. And he was also involved in the bombing campaign in England in 1939-1940. In fact, he trained Brendan Behan uh, in bomb-making techniques and Behan was caught on the first day that he arrived uh, in Liverpool in England, he, he mentions that at the beginning of Forstall Boy. But I, even though that was the case, and I had a, my, my mother's eldest sister's husband was a Stormont MP for the Republican Labour Party in the late 1940s, uh, I don't think that any of those uh, relatives actually influenced me. It wasn't until we moved from Anderson's Town to the Falls Road in 1963. I was 10 at the time, and uh, you then learnt suddenly about politics. Within one year, there was a general election, and Ian Paisley threatened to come on to the Falls Road in Divis Street to remove the Irish tricolour from, because Sinn Féin was a banned organisation, the, the candidate was running as an independent Labour, Republican candidate, and Paisley uh, forced the RUC, the police, to go in and smash the window and take out the tricolour. And it resulted in riots, which lasted for a full week. It affected me because I still attended school in Anderson's Town. And immediately, the Belfast Corporation published or punished the whole community and withdrew public services and uh, public transport. So Danny had to walk three miles to school every day and back, you know, thanks to Mr. Paisley. But interestingly, when I was writing about that in later years, I discovered that many of the people who were arrested, and you must understand, as if the Unionist state didn't have enough laws to repress our people. In the 1950s, they introduced another law called the Flags and Emblems Act. And that made it illegal to interfere with the flying of the Union Jack. Sorry, le illegal to interfere and with the flying of the Union Jack and illegal to fly the tricolour. So they used this law to humiliate the, the community of West Belfast. Uh, at this stage, by the way, where I lived on the Falls Road, there was a Presbyterian church, Broadway Presbyterian church, and the orange men marched on the Falls Road. They came up Broadway. Red, white, and blue bunting was put across the road. They played God Save the Queen in front of us, and then they proceeded into the church to have their father blessed. And this is, we were a vanquished community. We were afraid. Nobody, nobody threw a stone at the, at, the, at the orange men, this humiliation. And it was just accepted that even though we were a minority in this artificial state called Northern Ireland, we made up the majority of those who were forced to immigrate, who went to North America, because there was no employment, no proper housing. Again, in 1966, when our community 
was celebrating the 50th anniversary of the 1916 rising, the government banned all transport coming into Belfast to try and reduce the numbers attending that parade along the Falls Road, going to Milltown Cemetery where our patriot dead are buried. But we paid heavily for that because within a few weeks, two young nationalists were assassinated by the loyalists. In one case, a man called John Scullion, the RUC said, no, 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 he had been stabbed to death and made it appear as if it was a domestic uh, incident domestic uh, incident of violence. And the family insisted and got his body uh, dug up and a fresh inquest was held and it had been proved that he had been shot. Similarly, the other young man who was shot, Peter Ward, he was 17 years of age, his mother was my next door neighbour, he was shot dead uh, basically for being a Catholic. So just for being, just for, for, for commemorating 1916, our community suffered. Now, of course, one of the biggest influences uh, on the nationalist community in the North was the uh, Black Civil Rights Movement in North America. Me, growing into my teens, was also interested in the Vietnam War and what was happening uh, internationally. But it was the Civil Rights Movement in North America that heavily influenced us to form our own Civil Rights Movement. And the demands were, were very simple. One man, one vote. Uh, the fact of the matter is that the way the unionists, they gerrymandered constituencies, but they also had what was called the rate payers vote. So if you and I were of voting age, but we lived with our parents, only our parents would get the vote. But if you or I owned businesses, we would get two votes for each of the business premises that we owned. And because most of the businesses were owned by unionists, in this way, they were able to uh, uh, distort the voting figures, and of course, when they controlled local government, they controlled where factories went and where housing went. And in reaction to this, we marched, we were beaten into the ground, people were killed. In the case in, in Derry, after a protest, the RUC, the police, broke into the home of Sammy Devaney and uh, beat him so badly in front of his eight children that he, he died. Uh, and there was a huge funeral in Derry. And that was because of what the RUC had did in Derry in 1969. That's why the young people would not let the RUC into the bog side uh, after an orange march. But that led to what was called the Battle of the Bog side. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, I was 16 at that time. And we, the, the civil rights organization, the, the, the RUC had been fighting with the bog siders uh, for three or four days. And they were totally exhausted. The Stormont government, the unionist government, announced that it was going to be sent in reinforcements to die. And the civil rights organization asked for protests to be held in nationalist areas. Ironically, in our case in the Falls Road, it was to keep the police in Belfast, to stop them from going to Derry, because we were concerned that given that the, 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 their blood was up, there would be another incident where they would break into homes in Derry and, and kill people. I was at a protest on the Falls Road on the night of Thursday, the 14th of August, 1969. And uh, I left, because I lived further up the road, I left at about half past 10. And by the time I got home, I could hear the shoot. And it was truly frightening. It went on right throughout the night. The following morning, when my friends and I went down to the Falls Road, uh, a, a friend of mine was burnt out of his house. Uh, the RUC and loyalists come down to the Falls Road and for three quarters of a mile had burnt uh, everyone out of their home. The police had opened fire with heavy submachine guns. Uh, they killed the, the first British soldier to be killed in the conflict, Trooper Hugh McCain, a Catholic, home on leave, defended yeah. in his flats. First child to be killed, nine-year-old Patrick Rooney, shot dead in his bed by the police. We then put up barricades the next day. And in the background, unknown to me, the Republican movement, uh, was going through our arguments and differences. As a young lad, all we were concerned about was that nobody came to defend us. And in fact, up on the wall, there was a slogan, a piece of graffiti, IRA means I ran away. Inside the Republican movement, inside the IRA, there was a split along a number of ideological grounds. But the most emotional reason for that split was the fact that the then Republican leadership had wanted to concentrate solely, take seats in Westminster, uh, take seats in Stormont, which had, which had, you know, uh, was irreformable 
as far as we were concerned. And uh, the split occurred in late 1969, 1970, into the, 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 the organisation that wanted to defend the people said that we were setting up a provisional army council for six months to reorganise the IRA. Of course, the media immediately dubbed them the provisionals, provisional army council. That's where they got the name. And the other organisation was known as the officials or the official IRA. Uh, over a period of time, I sided with the group known as the provisionals. I, of course, became involved in activism by selling the Republican news uh, from underneath my coat outside St. Paul's Mass on a Sunday. And later, after the curfew, the British Army surrounded the Falls Road in July 1970 and began opening fire on a community that had never fired a shot at them. These weapons that were in the Falls Road were there to prevent another ma a massacre as it happened in August 1969. Uh, again, they shot dead another five people, wounded about 40 or 50 others. But if you fast forward, I mean, lots of repression, lots of killings took place, lots of raids, lots of brutality. The British Army, whom we invited into the area and welcomed as our saviours, very quickly turned their weapons on our, on our community. And uh, it was obvious that they were there to protect the status quo. They weren't there as peacekeepers. But if you look at the media or historians, the violence begins when the IRA fires the first shot. Yeah. Not what preceded it. And what preceded it was 50 years of humiliation, second class citizenship, or sports wasn't announced on the radio, or language wasn't announced on the radio, well, there was no uh, traditional Irish music broadcast on the radio, we couldn't have jobs, we couldn't get houses, and when we asked for jobs and houses, we were shot dead. We were beaten into the ground. And that was the root cause of the beginning of the IRA's armed struggle because we began to believe that we weren't going to get our civil rights unless we got our national rights. And that's, it was a, in many ways, it was a replay of 1916 to 1921 when basically we in, we in the North, nationalist communities in the North, we were sacrificed so that the people in the 26 counties could have their freedom and we paid dearly for it. Now, uh, You've had an amazing career, uh, and it's 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 really fascinating um, um, to hear you talk about it and whatnot. I want to talk uh, more specifically about your work um, uh, with the hunger strikers, and and can you kind of on that same mentality that you just gave out, can you kind of talk about what life was like for the political prisoners that led them to hunger strikes? Um, I don't think people really understand that that was not, you know, I always. I always tell people like it didn't like they woke up on a Tuesday and decided this is what we're going to do. There was a steady buildup. There was a, a movement that had led them to this point. Uh, and you were kind of there for all of that uh, and then saw a lot of it firsthand. Can you kind of lead us through your career, but also what you were seeing from the political prisoners uh, and, and the handling of that? Well, this, uh, you can actually understand this better if you understand history. And the fact of the matter is, is that whenever any imperial power including Britain. I mean, George Washington was a terrorist as far as Lord Cornwallis and yeah, yeah, yeah. back then was, was concerned. So they, they demonize you, they criminalize you, they try to undermine you, to demoralize you, they try to prove that they're superior to you, the slavish mentality. And uh, throughout Irish history, there's always been resistance to English, the English attempt at English conquest of Ireland. Uh, in 1917, the first Republican hunger striker, Thomas Ashe, was force-fed and died within a short space of time. A few years later, uh, Terence McSweeney, who was the Lord Mayor of Cork, was seized from his home, brought to England, went on hunger strike, and uh, he died on hunger strike uh, as well. So they were they, they, their protest was to be treated as either POWs or political prisoners, and of course they were political prisoners. So that's that, that was the, the background to it. We, we weren't going to allow Britain to call us criminals, because the crime here was their interference in our affairs, um, the way generations of our people suffered under British rule. So as the IRA armed struggle began in 70 to 71, 
and the, the numbers of prisoners in jail built up. The IRA prisoners in Crumlin Road jail uh, called a hunger called for a hunger strike, and their objective was political status. This was, by the way, this, a few months after Bloody Sunday. And another thing that our listeners need to understand is that the people who died of Bloody Sunday were protesting against internment, which the British had introduced a few months earlier in August 71. And I, the reason why I said it's, it's important to understand that there's this relationship, close relationship between the nationalist community and the prisoners. Even when I was growing up, men, men would be pointed out in the street. He's such and such. He was given the cat of nine tails. He was whipped in Crumlin Road Jail. He, this man over here, he escaped from Derry Prison in 1941. So the, the people who took part in the previous struggle and who handed down this torch of resistance were held in great uh, esteem and respect in our community. So similarly, whenever the British introduced internment and tortured uh, 12 selected prisoners through brutal uh, treatment, the people who died of Bloody Sunday were protesting against internment. So a few months later, Republican prisoners go on hunger strike. But before anyone dies, the British government concedes political status. It was actually called special category status because they didn't want to use Republican yeah. terminology. But it meant that if you were arrested, uh, obviously you went through interrogation and you could, you could be beaten. But when you finally arrived in prison, you would be living under IRA structures. The prison administration would deal with the commanding officer of the IRA. And indeed, in 1972, when I, when I was interned in Long Cash, uh, and, and I was interned with men who had been interned in the 40s. And when they had been interned in the 40s, they had been interned with men who had been interned in the 20s. So there's, this whole, there's a whole period of the history of the Northern Ireland state where oh, for only two years in the early 1950s, there were no political prisoners. But from 1920, from the foundation of the state right till now, there have been political prisoners in jail, in jail here. So we, in Long Cash, you know, we wore our own clothes, we cleaned our own hut, uh, our letters came in to, through the Republican structures, our food parcels came in through the Republican structures. And this, this uh, political status that we had applied to sentenced Republican prisoners, those who had been convicted of armed offences, uh, bank robberies, carrying out uh, landmine attacks, gun attacks, ambushes on the British Army. And it led to relative peace in the prison. I haven't said that. There were still prisoners died when I was there of medical neglect. If you hit the emergency button, they wouldn't mm. come and somebody would die. Another uh, friend of mine, Jared, Jared Coney, who, who slept two beds away from me, I had just been released at this stage and the prisoners uh, weren't down the camp in protest against conditions. Uh, Jared had tried to escape through a tunnel, and uh, as he emerged from the tunnel, a British soldier shot him dead. So whilst the prisoners had died and conditions were, were, were poor, and we always had to campaign for them, no prison officers had ever been attacked by the IRA. No prison officer had lost his life. And then the British government realized that the way the world viewed these prisoners was that they were guerrillas, they were political prisoners, and they didn't like that because they wanted to try and depict the situation as one of law and order, and not a colonial situation where David versus Goliath, where the local people were uprising against the British imperialism and its armed forces. So they decided to renege uh, on the agreement that it had made in 1872, and they decided that anyone convicted after the 1st of March 1976, would not have political status. So you'd be stripped, you'd be told to put on a prison uniform, your name was gone, you had a prison number, you were to call the prison officer, sir, and obey all orders. And of course, the 90% of the prison officers were from the unionist community or former British soldiers. And they, these are the people who were, who, were, who were in charge of you. The British government knew from history but the Republicans would never accept that. They knew, but they had it in their heads that if they could break prisoners, these men held in solitary confinement, who were vulnerable, if they could beat and break them, it would have a demoralizing effect on the struggle and on the resistance outside. 
and it was as cynical and as callous as that. And so, for four and a half years, hundreds of young men were who were convicted in uh, were they were arrested under special laws. They were interrogated in special interrogation centres. They went for, before special courts. The legislation defining scheduled offences, that is, uh, armed attacks on the state, described them as political. So they were special until they got to jail, and then they were they were just ordinary, and they were they were they were brutally beaten. Uh, they were prevented from going to the toilet, from washing, and they went on a, a, what was called a no wash protest. Uh, they weren't allowed out of their cells. When they poured the urine underneath the doors, it was hosed back in again. When they poured their excrement out the window, the windows were boarded up. And so they went on uh, this uh, no wash protest in which they lived 24 hours a day in their own feces, no exercise, no writing, no newspapers, no radio, no soap, one visit per month, and the resistance was incredible. They they shared it out the doors at night. Bobby Sands was a good storyteller. They had concerts. Uh, the prison officers knew that, for example, they were smuggling tobacco on the, on the few visits that they had, and so they tried to humiliate them, uh, bend over mirrors, putting prison officers putting their fingers up the back passages, then putting it in their mouths, and searching for, allegedly for contraband tobacco. And it was a, a, an epic struggle, but it could not go on. Even Cardinal O'Fee, the All-Ireland Primate, visited the jail, and he said, I have never seen anything like this. Uh, it reminds me of the sewers of Calcutta. He says quite clearly these people are political prisoners. They're part of Irish history. But of course, Mrs. Thatcher, who had become Prime Minister in 1979, she would not uh, compromise at all. One of her mantras, by the way, was, uh, how can I talk to you? You don't have a mandate. Because of course, at this stage, uh, Sinn Féin, which had been barred from taking part in elections for many years, we, we the, the, that prescription had, had been lifted in the mid-70s. But we were still subject. I mean, as editor of Republican News, in our office was bombed. Uh, several of our drivers were shot. The British Army tried to close down our newspaper, arrested all of us. We were put in jail, criminal jail, uh, in 1978 and 1979, all in an attempt to close down the paper. Uh, Sinn Féin leaders, people who, dis who became spokespersons, were assassinated. Vice President of Sinn Féin, Maura Drum, yeah. was assassinated in her hospital bed. Uh, loyalists who were probably organised by British intelligence came in dressed as doctors and uh, killed her in her hospital bed when she was recovering from an operation. So you had all this this whole uh, oppressive state against our people, and they could not break the people. And the mothers organised relatives action committees. There was a national hate block uh, protest movement organised. The women in Armagh jail. Who the IRA women in Norma jail were in a slightly different category in that they weren't forced to wear a uniform. They were allowed to wear their own clothes, but they were still held in solitary confinement. And so in, in 1980, which is 40 years ago, uh, a number of prisoners in the hate blocks went on hunger strike. And I was involved that year. The IRA, by the way, went, as a result of the beatings of the prisoners, and the fact that the prisoners were dragged out of their cells, plunged into hot baths, they used shears to cut their hair and cut their beards, the men were cut all over and badly beaten. You know, I was getting reports of teeth knocked out, broken noses, busted eardrums, and we could not get the media to report the brutality of what was going on uh, in, in that jail. The IRA had attacked prison officers, but Jerry Adams and I, around... February 1980, he began secretly meeting with Cardinal O'Fee, and he was secretly meeting with the British government prisons minister, uh, or Secretary of State Humphrey Humphrey Atkins, and we were trying to we were trying to resolve it before it came to hunger strike. Cardinal O'Fee said, "Look, give me something to go to the British with." So we approached the IRA. The IRA announced that it was uh, ending its attacks on prison officers, trying to encourage an atmosphere for compromise. 
uh, Cardinal Fee, just before that hunger strike ended, because the prisoners wanted to wear their own clothes, they wanted to be able to leave their cells, they wanted to visit, to write the, to write the letters, to write the exercise. But the, I suppose the most symbolic demand that they wanted was not to wear a prison uniform and to wear their own clothes. So Cardinal Fee had a meeting with uh, Thatcher, and he phoned us. He was on his way to, to, from London to Rome, exactly going to see the Pope. He phoned us to say, she's agreed, they can wear their own clothes. And we said, what a relief that was. Of course, as he was in the air, the British government issued a statement saying, no, 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 not their own clothes. Prison issue civilian type clothes, another uniform. And that's what, that's what uh, triggered the first hunger strike. It lasted for 53 days. I was liaison with the, the hunger strikers. And around about December, mid-December 1978, or 1980, sorry, the British government contacted us through a secret channel, uh, saying that they, they wanted to, to resolve it. And uh, they were to send a document into the, into the prisoners in the prison hospital. I had been up that week, and I had acquainted the OC of the, the IRA prisoners, Bretton Hughes, that uh, a document was going to be on its way. But meantime, one of the hunger strikers, Sean McKenna, his condition deteriorated rapidly. And he was close to death. And Bretton Hughes uh, uh, called off the hunger strike on the basis that this document was to... Was, was put to the document came about an hour after medical intervention to save Sean McKenna's life. And of course, Sean never recovered from that hunger strike. A few years later, on the anniversary of the hunger strike, he took his own life. When the British government realised that the hunger strike was over, they realised that if we had held on, we shouldn't have sent that document. So they actually repudiated uh, all the promises that were in the document to be a progressive prison regime. This will be done, that will be done. In other words, basically, the prisoners would, would get their five demands, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't be described as such, and that was okay. They're reneging on that document, just as they had reneged on the original political status agreement, triggered the second hunger strike, which began on the 1st of March, 1981. Uh, it was designed differently from the first hunger strike. Bobby would start it on his own. Bobby Sand would start it on his own. Then others would join in. Uh, at fortnightly intervals. This was because there was concern that uh, in the first hunger strike, Brent Hughes had been, uh, and the other hunger strikers, uh, you know, were psychologically uh, very, very weak in terms of their, their physical condition. And so Bobby wanted to, to, to lead the hunger strike. And the arrangement was that any negotiations that were to take place would involve uh, Bobby, Brandon McFarland, Vic McFarland, who took over it, the rest of the prisoners, when Bobby went to the prison hospital, and Jay Adams and myself. So Bobby uh, went on hunger strike, and he was only on hunger strike about two weeks, I think, when the MP for Fermanagh and South Tyrone, Frank McGuire, uh, died of a heart attack. Uh, Frank McGuire had been an independent MP, and a friend of the prisoners had called upon the British government to give in to their five demands. A by-election, which, over which we had no control, was called for Fermanagh South Road, and we realised this would be a great opportunity here for publicity. And Thatcher had said, how can I talk to you? You don't have a mandate. So we put forward Bobby's, Bobby's name, and uh, it was an extraordinary campaign. Uh, I was Bobby's spokesperson, obviously, he was in the hospital hunger strike. He couldn't do TV or radio, and they wouldn't have let them. So I did, I did all of the, the election broadcasts, and the campaign... It was, I mean, it, it, after Bloody Sunday, a lot of people were afraid to go out marching. But with this hunger strike, I saw people who hadn't been out since 1972. A lot of middle class people, doctors, nurses, nuns, out marching, calling for the prisoners to be given uh, their five demands. Bobby won the election. It was, I mean, I, I, I mean at the count, in the Technical College in Enniskill, the world's media was there. It was just um, unbelievable. Uh, and yet Bobby remained, you know, he, he, he said, that's just still going to let me die. You know, we thought, now oh, you're an MP. They'll send somebody in 
we can negotiate and end this. That was the hope. I mean, during the campaign, our people had been attacked and shot. Uh, cars had driven past, people putting up election posters. So Thatcher's reaction to Bobby's death, or Bobby's election, was to rush through legislation, an amendment to the representation of the People Act, to make sure that no other prisoner, barring any other prisoner, not just in the north of Ireland, any prisoner, any Irish prisoner anywhere in the world from standing in an election uh, in the north of Ireland. Because we had prisoners in America, we had prisoners in the south of Ireland, we had prisoners in England. And she refused to recognise uh, his, his mandate. Of course, Bobby died after 66 days. It was, I mean, news of his death led to protests around the world. There were thousands of people marching in Madrid and Paris. Protests, ongoing protests in the uh, outside uh, in New York and Washington, ongoing protests. We later discovered, of course, the British government and even the British ambassador had approached the editor of the New York Times, saying, "Why are you calling these people guerrillas? They're terrorists. Use the word terrorist." They says, "No, no. As far as we're concerned, these people are guerrillas. They are uh, guerrillas. They're waging an age-old uh, war against British interference in Ireland." So it was an incredible time. At the hunger strike. Lasted seven months. Ten young men, uh, two of whom were married, Joe MacDonald and, and Bobby, lost their lives. We put up other hunger strikers and prisoners in the election in the south of Ireland in June 1981. And two of those were elected, Paddy Agnew, who was on the blanket protest, and Kieran Doherty, who uh, was, was just beginning a hunger strike. But Kieran got elected to the Irish Parliament. Uh, after Bobby's death, the for some reason another by election which we hadn't anticipated was called for from Alan South Tyrone, and we were uh, we were not allowed to run a prisoner candidate because of this amendment to the legislation. So we put up Owen Caron, school teacher, who had been Bobby's election agent, and again, massive propaganda campaign in the British media, massive repression of us trying to muster the electorate for Poland Day. Uh, but Owen got elected as well. And again, this was an opportunity for Thatcher to uh, deal with the issue and compromise, and she refused. When the, when the, the hunger strike ended on the 3rd of October 1981, a new British Secretary of State came in and he had talked about setting up an assembly at Stormont. Now Sinn Féin hadn't run in elections, both because we were banned and because I mean, most everything was stacked against us, the level of harassment, the tax, etc. Uh, we needed to be able to participate in elections. But constitutionally, in, in, in our constitution, we, 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 we were prohibited from running for elections in the north, especially to Stormont, and we needed to change that. And so at our annual conference, RR Dash, we put down a motion asking delegates to empower the incoming national executive to have the power to decide in the circumstances and in the context whether it was a good idea for us to contest these assembly elections. We thought it was a done deal, dead easy to get passed through. Uh, but suddenly it was meeting resistance uh, at the R Dash. And Jerry Adams says, we everybody get up there and speak to the issue. So I got up to speak, and it was just a spontaneous image that I had in my head, because I knew that people were worried that if once you go into the constitutional politics and electoralism, uh, you become corrupted by the system and tainted. And people were concerned that it would have an effect on resources, on personnel, and that the armed struggle of the IRA which Martin McGuinness had once described as the cutting edge of the struggle, uh, would be would be reduced, would be undermined and, and compromised. So I used this expression of a normalite and a ballot box, that we're a revolutionary organisation and that we could fight on many fronts. The IRA was there fighting its guerrilla warfare, but we could open up an electoral front because the British government are obviously embarrassed they were embarrassed by Owen Cairns' election. They were embarrassed by Bobby Sands' election. Bobby got twice the majority that Thatcher got in her constituency in 
intensely and still she wouldn't talk. So we saw this as an opportunity and it was passed. The so following that's, year. That's where the armor light and the, and the ballot box strategy comes out of. I said, who, who here would object if with an armor light in this hand and a ballot paper in this hand, a ballot box in this hand, we took power in Ireland and got a big round of applause. The vote was taken and we won the vote. And that was the Bobby Sands' election. The peace process, where we are today, all the progress that we have made, Sinn Féin being the largest party in Ireland, you know, took more votes in the South in the, in the last election than any other party. And in the North, we have supplanted the S, John Hume's SDLP and become, the, the, we are the, the, the party that the nationalist community has chosen to represent it in, in the North of Ireland. So that goes back to then. Uh, now, an election was called for the Assembly. This is what's important because I know uh, free speech is extremely important to people in the USA. We ran for the assembly election. We were harassed throughout it. I mean, some of our offices, uh, people opened fire on our offices. Our posters were torn down. Massive campaign of harassment. But we took, in our first election, we took 35% of the nationalist vote. So Jay Adams got elected. Martin McInnes got elected. Owen got elected. Another candidate, Jim McAllister, representing Murray and Armagh, got elected. And I got elected in Mid Ulster, where, where Bernadette Davlin used to be the MP. The British government still would not uh, speak to us. Uh, and in fact, the unionists up at Storm had passed a motion depriving us of all papers, economic papers, statistics about unemployment, about housing. Uh, because the British government wouldn't talk to us and the conflict was continuing, a, a, a politician in London. Ken Livingstone, who was the chairperson of the Greater London Council, said he was going to break, he was going to a call for peace talks. So he invited Jay Adams and myself to London. On the eve of going to the peace talks, television announced that Mrs. Thatcher had introduced exclusion orders against myself and Jerry Adams, which meant that had we left the North and gone to England to, take, to give a speech, take part in TV or radio, we would be arrested and sentenced to five years in jail. That exclusion order was held against me for 14 years. And the irony of it was, at the time of this, Thatcher was complaining that uh, so the Soviets were refusing to let Andrea Sakharov, who was a Nobel Peace Prize winner, they had excluded him to the provinces. He wasn't allowed to come into Moscow. And she was doing exactly the same with us, I mean, allegedly with British, with full British passports, but we weren't allowed to enter Britain without going to jail for five years. So they, all every time we succeeded, the rules were changed, including, of course, in, in 1988, when Thatcher couldn't, despite all of the pressure she put on the media and British programming had to change, there was self-censorship in the media, she had then introduced a broadcasting ban against Sinn Féin, so that we weren't allowed to appear on TV or radio. Uh, now, she made an exception. In the two weeks before an election, you could be heard on TV or radio. But the fact of the matter is, you win elections between elections. You don't win, yeah. win an election in the two weeks in the run-up to a campaign. She didn't even appear in the House of Commons when she passed the Broadcasting, uh, Act, uh, broadcasting Act against us. Where was she? She was in Poland, talking to the Poland people about censorship, and they shouldn't be held, you know, by the communists under the total, absolute hypocrisy. So, just uh, you've lived through uh, the conflict, the hunger strikes. You've gone from conflict uh, to peaceful means. Like, what, is, what do you think the future holds? Like, what direction do you think you guys are, are going now? Well, in, in between times, I was sentenced to eight years in jail. I was... Well, it wasn't I was, <laughs> I was to... I, I, well, after, the, the, after being banned from England and after being officially censored under the Broadcast Act, uh, about 14 months later, uh, an IRA informer had come forward to 
to say that he was prepared to name at a press conference his uh, intelligence agents who were trying to encourage him to set up a number of people for assassinations, state assassinations. And this was very important to us because we had been alleging for many years that there was collusion between the loyalists and British intelligence, uh, both in the arming of the loyalists and in the selection of target who they were assassinated. I went to meet this guy and uh, I never met him, but the house was immediately surrounded. I was arrested and I was charged, and he never gave any evidence against me personally. I was charged with conspiring to murder him, kidnap him, uh, and, uh, and IRA membership. Uh, so I, it was obvious that they could, there was no evidence against me on any of these crimes, but still I, I got sentenced to eight years in jail. So I was in prison when the ceasefire was called. But I mean, I was I was the I was the the uh, chair of Sinn Fein in the hits box at this period. And by the way, uh, this is something I forgot to say. But after the hunger strike, after the ten men died, the British government conceded all of the prisoners' yeah. demands, so that whenever I, now I'm in the hits box, it's the 1990s. We're wearing our own clothes. We're running our own wings. I did an Open University Arts Foundation course. I wrote two books, three books, while I was in, in, in prison. And uh, the prison officers and us, prison officers and us had a, res a respectful uh, engagement. There was no, you know, they understood and recognized that we were political prisoners. And in fact, they would tell you, we were only carrying out orders. We always knew you were political prisoners. So I come out of jail then, uh, I, I wrote a few papers for Sinn Féin for George Mitchell's the decommissioning paper. I participated in it. But I'd always wanted to be a, a writer from I was about 14 or 15. But from 1968, 69 onwards, I, you know, I, 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 I didn't finish my A-levels to go to university because I was involved with the movement. And uh, I suppose whatever uh, purported talent I have as a communicator, I gave to the movement and that, you know, editor of Public News and Pub Black and Director of Publicity for all those years. So I then uh, said, Jerry, I approached Jerry Adams and I said, Jerry, I'm mean, our grandfather, uh, you know, just out of jail. Um, I really want to be a writer, so I'm not going back to full-time activism, but got my full support. So uh, I, I, I'm a total believer in, in, in uh, Sinn Féin Project. I think what the leadership have achieved is, is miraculous. The state that I live in, is, I no longer feel vanquished. Uh, now, we haven't ended the union with Britain. So that, sure. that still exists. That still is, uh, sticks in my throat. But we have achieved so much. Every institution in this state is open to a nationalist uh, stroke Republican. Uh, you, know, the, you remember the DUP, their mantra was smash and fein IRA. And occasionally when they turn around and, and say, oh, the IRA ceased fired and the tried to provoke, et cetera, you know, I, I come out with this. I says, well, well the grill is fought. And now the grillers are in government. And, you know, and, and then they realize that we all have to compromise here. And, we, and we've all had to make choices, difficult choices. Uh, but for the sake of our children and our children's children, you know, we've, we've reached this accommodation in the Good Friday uh, Agreement, and there is a clear political path towards us politically and peacefully achieving our objectives. Good. Now, uh, you've mentioned uh, several uh, books that you have, you have written, or uh, you've mentioned that you've written several books. One of them is a fantastic book. It's, it's uh, Hunger Strikes. Uh, sorry, Hunger Strike, uh, Reflections. I, um, this book is different than what I thought it would be. Rather than being um, uh, one, one person telling a narrative uh, about it, it's actually a collection of a lot of different uh, people coming together and, and tackling the one subject matter from um, just several different story points and, and kind of uh, uh, approaches and whatnot, which I, I thought was fascinating. It really offered a, a, an amazing thing. Um, how did that book come to light? And then also, what is one recommendation you'd make 
to anyone who wanted to learn more, uh, either a book or a website or, or, you know, what is it that you would say, if you want to learn more, this is, this is my recommendation to you. Well, when, after Bobby died, when, as editor of the Fulbrook and Republican News, Bobby had, had, uh, had been writing poetry, which I was publishing, and his short stories. And after his death, he, he had bequeathed his writings to us. And after his death, we set up the Bobby Sands Trust. So it consists of former comrades, people who were in jail with, with Bobby, or her former ex-prisoners. So on that would be Jerry Adams and myself, uh, Tom Hartley, Later became Mayor yeah. Belfast, a Sinkin archivist. Uh, uh, Brenda McFarlane, who was the OC of the prisoners during the, the hunger strike. Carl McKillen, who's currently a minister in the Stormont government and who's also a former political prisoner. Uh, Sheila Dara, who was the OC, the commanding officer of the IRA prisoners in Armagh jail when the women were in hunger strike in 1980. So we, we it's our job to promulgate uh, the writings of Bobby Sands and also to protect the memory of the hunger strikers. And we do that through publications such as this, uh, this book or sponsoring uh, you know, pieces of writing, or in one case, a, a sculptor, a, a bust of, of Bobby, made by a young Irish man who was, who was studying a sculptor, sculptor in, in, in Greece. Uh, so by a large number of, of methods, we, we, we preserve and ensure. And then interestingly, Bobby's writings have never been out of print in 39 years. And that is just, that is just, uh-huh. you know, the and, and I monitor the Bobby Sands Trust website and uh, we are inundated. Last year, uh, a choreography group in London wrote a 35 a spectacular piece of dancing based around Bobby's poem, Comrades in the Dark. There's a, a, a composer in Los Angeles uh, trying to re- re- uh, read an opera around, around Bobby, uh, you know, and, and all the hunger strikers are remembered in their own way, in their own home areas, even though Bobby, because, of course, he was first on the hunger strike, he was an MP, he was a poet, he was a writer, Bobby, Bobby tends to get most of, of the attention. But we decided, one of, in one of Bobby's poems, called The Crime of Castle Ray, and it, it's an appointment that it actually I, sadly reflects a, a moment when he was quite down, uh, you know, given all the suffering that they were going through. And he he wrote this piece about the men of art have lost their heart. You know, where are the poets? They're supposed to, the poets are supposed to be a conscience. I mean, if you, you know, if you remember Shelley, the poets are the real legislators uh, of, of humanity. Where were they? All the suffering's going on. They'd be more concerned about something that was happening five thousand miles away, and it was it was a, a critique of, of 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 the poets and artists who were ignoring that you know, ninety miles from Dublin, this torture was taking place. So on the back of that, and influenced by that, I decided to approach a variety of artists and poets and ask them to respond to to the hunger strike. Now, some of some of the people had been loyal throughout, like people like Christy Moore, had you know had written "Ninety Miles from Dublin Town," one of the finest and saddest songs about the death of a hunger stricker and his relationship with his mother. The time has come. Another beautiful song, uh, Bobby Balla, the the artist, uh, the cover of that book. Bobby Bobby painted that in 1979, and yet it's prophetic. It's of a blanket man on a mortuary slab, which was to come true. Yeah. In 1981, so Bobby writes about uh, how he how he uh, painted that very very stark painting. But we've other people, John Montague, Ireland's first poet laureate, he wrote several poems about uh, the, the hunger strike. Uh, Edna, Edna O'Brien, who's probably down for the next Nobel laureate for fiction, uh, Edna O'Brien wrote a memo to Bobby, uh, and then you discover, you know, uh, the the the, the uh, the actor, uh, of course, his first name skips me, Cusack. He, he, he wrote a poem about the death of, of Joe McDonald. So we've got this collection of, of writers from, from around the world and, and, of course, from Ireland. Uh, I wrote the introduction to it. The introduction was brought up to date uh, last August. But one of the finest pieces in that, in my opinion, is George Stagg's account. Because before the 10 hunger strikers, 
two other IRA volunteers died, I think, in England's jails during this conflict. Yeah. Uh, they they were they had a very simple demand. You see, if a British soldier is involved in a drunken incident here, they're very rarely charged with killing people here. But if a British soldier is charged with assault here or a traffic accident here, after he's sentenced, he's moved to England to a jail around the corner from his home. So Michael Gohan and Frank Stagg, who were in jail in England, had a simple demand which exists under European law, be repatriated closer to their homes and to sure. their elderly folk. The British government promised them that they would do that when they were in hunger strike. And of course, when they ended their hunger strike, they reneged on that, and that led to further hunger strikes. So Michael Gohan died in June 1974, and Frank Stagg died in February 1976, I think on his fifth hunger strike. But George, his brother, writes about Frank's death and what happened to Frank's body. Frank has been sent home from England to Ballina and Frank and Michael Gohan, who were in jail together, were comrades from Ballin for Mayo and, then, and Frank asked to be buried with Michael Gohan. The Irish government hijacked the airplane mid-air, yeah. flew the body to Shannon. Under military guard, brought it to Ballina, buried it in an unmarked grave, poured four tons of concrete on top of it in order to prevent Frank Stagg from having a Republican funeral. Those were dark days, uh, times of the Fine Gael Labour Coalition in the 70s, where Amnesty International actually criticises the Irish government for what was for use of the heavy gangs, these gangs of detectives who were interrogating it brutally uh, setting people up, false charges, etc. So George gives an account, and it's just, to me, the book is worth George's account alone. He talks about him and several friends digging up Frank's body. Digging, George bought the grave next to Frank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in the middle of the night, 14 months later, cold November night, they dig down, they take Frank's body out, and they put it in the grave with Michael Gohan. And it's an astonishing story of brotherly love. I mean, I just think it's a beautiful, beautiful story. You ask me uh, uh, about other books, I mean, there's a biography uh, about Bobby Sands uh, by Dennis, uh, Dennis, God, made my head's away. Uh, Nothing but an unfinished song. And then there's the, the, the book, the first book, Major Study of the Hunger Strike, written by a South African author called David Burstwood, the late David Burstwood. And then it's called Ten Men Dead. And yes. we allowed David Burstwood to have access. Tom Hartley, the archivist, who I mentioned who's on the trust, Tom Hartley, our offices were subject to raids. We would be raided by the British Army regularly, stole photographs, stole everything. Our machinery, our type, our type, typewriters, etc. But Tom, as soon as messages came in from Bobby Sands or the other blanket men, the women in Armagh, Tom had them uh, translated, transcribed, and smuggled out of the office. And so we have this archive preserved. It's now in the National Library in Dublin, and we allowed David Burrisford to access this. The book again is an astonishing book because he has all of the written correspondence between Bobby and the leadership of the Republican movement. It deals with strategy, it deals with confusion, it deals with raw feelings, how difficult and traumatic it was for the families. So that book has never been out of, out of print uh, either. And that, that's the book that I would always point people towards. Ten Men Dead, David Burrisford. And, uh, and of course our essay book, which you just showed there. Oh, absolutely. No, the Ten Men Dead is one that I recommend uh, whenever Hibernian brothers or or anybody who come to me and you know ask for recommendations or if it comes up, I always tell them Ten Men Dead is it's a must read. I think it paints uh, a really complete picture uh, in, in a lot of different ways. Um, the fr the stag story is actually also you, you hit a note on me and I love that story because I think it uh, I think I don't think it's very well known in the states, uh, but I think when people hear it, it really resonates with. With, George you know, only told this story two years ago, for the first time. Oh, really? Oh, yes. It was a secret, uh, all that. And also uh, illegal. It's illegal 
to yes. pick up a body <laughs> to this day. Uh, so George, uh, I spoke to him before he, he told the story. He actually told it on, on a radio program, and then the story was written for the book. So it's 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 the first time it's ever been told in, in that type of detail. It's a astonishing story. That's amazing. Danny, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to sit down with me today to talk about these things. You have an absolutely incredible life. It is truly an honor to hear you talk about it. Uh, I very much look forward to being able to, to cross back over to the pond and, and, and hear more from you. Uh, I'd love to buy you a beer and um, just kind of pick your brain on stuff. Uh, for anybody who's wondering, uh, the book Hunger Strike is available on Amazon, so you can pick that up there. Um, you can also visit the Bobby Sands Trust. The website is uh, bobbysandstrust.com. Um, there are songs, written books. It's, it's a great website. Uh, and if you haven't taken time to share this uh, video and to become a friend of Sinn Féin, uh, please take the time to do that. Uh, it's such an amazing thing uh, to hear about and to learn about. And the greatest way to do that is, to, from, from our standpoint, is to be a friend of the Sinn Féin. So, Danny, thank you so much for taking the time. I, I really appreciate everything you've done. And, and uh, I, it really has been a, a true honor, man. I, I, I love well, it. Thank, thank you to all our brothers and sisters in America and for the solidarity that they have shown over the years and which has been so essential to the survival of our great struggle. Oh, thank you again. Uh, thank you. To everybody, we'll see you next time. Salam. So